Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the last day forum. Um, I've really enjoyed the last two days, so uh, hopefully we can keep it up for, for today as well. Uh, my name's Glenn Corder. I'm the Program Leader for Operational Solutions. Uh, I'm based at the University of Queensland at the Sustainable Minerals Institute. So uh, we're uh, really pleased that the, well, I'm really pleased the conference has gone uh, well over the last couple of days uh, being on all uh, being online and also I really enjoyed the uh, the networking event here in Brisbane last night where we had drinks it was a little bit wet getting in but uh, those of you who came along it was it was great to see you then really enjoyable and I'm sure I hope, I'm sure it was the same in Perth although I think the weather sounded like it was a little bit a little bit better so welcome to this session where we're going to actually kick off with a, a keynote uh, speaker by uh, Patrick Walter. So Patrick um, works for New Century uh, Resources. So to, uh, he's going to give an overview of some of the, uh, what I think is you know, exciting and interesting work they're doing and then go into the foundational projects. But before I do that, I do want to acknowledge owners of, so just, there we go. For, I uh, acknowledge the traditional custodians across the lands on which we live and work, and we pay our respect to elders both past and present. So here at the University of Queensland, I'm on the uh, Turrbal and Jagera uh, people's lands. So I just also like to say that if you could also note, uh, if you're aware of the lands that of the traditional owners you're on, if you could just uh, acknowledge that as well. So I just, um, I, I don't think there's any housekeeping issues. If there are, then I've conveniently forgot them, but probably just as you go through, if you could just probably the one thing that I should say is that when we will be taking Q, uh, questions at the end of, of Patrick's presentation and also at the end of the five minute videos that we have for each of our foundational uh, project uh, uh, presentations, which will be coming after uh, Patrick's presentation. So there will be Q and A. And if you can just put your questions into the uh, live Q&A button, right, and then I'll be able up. to moderate that as, as we go forward. So really, I just wanted to talk a little bit about operational solutions. Uh, our program um, is really the action, is really focusing on the action during the mining operations and mining closure will be determined the list, sorry, the level of risk and opportunity for post mining activity. So that's uh, what we see as a, a core focus of this, this program of work. And the operational solutions program is about you know developing improved decision making processes across the life of the mine to deliver operational interventions to reduce the long term post closure risk to infrastructure landforms water ecosystems and people and deliver fit for purpose post mining land use so it obviously has strong connections in with the other three programs uh, that have been discussed uh, earlier on in uh, in in the conference over the last last couple of days so I just thought we, I'd kick off with that and then just uh, move on to our keynote pre presentation so Patrick is the managing director of uh, New Century Resources and I'll let me just give you a little bit of background about um, Patrick um, Patrick is a qualified metallurgist uh, mineral economist and board executive with experience across both technical and commercial roles within the mining and water treatment industries. Graduating from Melbourne University with degrees in chemical engineering and science, Patrick has gone on to complete postgraduate studies, including an MBA, Master of Science, Mineral Economics, and the Diploma of Project Management. Uh, Patrick is a graduate of the AICD's company director's course in 2015 Patrick was awarded Young Achiever of the Year at the Australian Mining Prospect Awards and in 2018 was awarded the Mining uh, News Emerging Leader of, of the Year Award. In 2017, Patrick founded New Century Resources and became Managing Director following the successful negotiation and acquisition of the Century Zinc Mine in Queensland. His role is focused on leading the company in all facets of the operation, again establishing Century as one of the top 15 zinc producers globally, while also facilitating the economic rehabilitation of the mine site. Patrick has a broad level of resource industry experience through Rio Tinto, Clean Tech, SciTech Pacific mine, uh, Mining, uh, Cradle Resources, Carbon Resource, and Primary Gold. So that's a, a very impressive CV, Patrick. So. Thank you for giving, our, your, uh, giving us a keynote presentation and I'm sure it's going to be really interesting and stimulating and I'm really looking forward. So over to you, Patrick. 
And uh, yeah, thanks very much, Glenn. Um, I assume you can hear me fine. Um, I really appreciate this uh, the time and uh, and everyone uh, tuning in to listen to a bit of the new century story and uh, and certainly for CRC for putting on this this really important event. So really great to see these events uh, gaining more and more traction um, uh, as things progress in the world. Uh, I also really like the concept of, of operational solutions, as you call it, Glenn, because it's very much what New Century is about in, in this sphere of, of uh, rehabilitation. It's providing solutions um, rather than um, uh, papering over problems or, or anything like that. Uh, today, I'm going to present to you the New Century story. Uh, now, New Century is, is really a, a case study, or it's now a couple of case studies, in what we call economic rehabilitation. Now, the, the phrase is uh, sort of caught on in a number of different um, models. I think a, a circular economy and that sort of thing are, are getting bandied around at the moment. Um, we've, we've called it for a number of years economic rehabilitation, which is principally looking at mining and mining operations, but providing a net environmental benefit as we, as we proceed. So uh, as has been discussed, we own the Century Zinc Mine. Only just recently, we've acquired the Mount Lyle copper mine uh, down in uh, in Tasmania. Uh, so another interesting story down there. But I want to take you through both those operations, what we've achieved at, at the Century Mine to date, and uh, what we plan to do the the copy paste, so to speak, down at the um, at the at in Tassie there as well. So it's a it's a pretty exciting development for us after uh, after the uh, the four years of hard work up at Century. Giving you a very quick overview of, of uh, Century first before we, we talk about the economic rehabilitation principles. So you'll see here, Century is a, a very famous mine uh, in terms of Australian mining history. So located in, in far northwest Queensland. Uh, it was actually discovered by Rio Tinto back in the 1990s. Uh, it was developed by Pazminko in early 2000. A massive original ore body, 120 million tonnes of uh, zinc and lead mineralisation, about 12% zinc and lead, but a very much a stranded asset, so sort of 300 kilometres north of Mount Isa. So around $2 billion was spent on developing the asset itself. So not only the, the mine site, uh, so, you know, a very large um, uh, 10 million tonne or up to 10 million tonne per annum operation, 700 man camp, private airport with sealed runway, uh, 300 kilometre high voltage power line down to Mount Isa, 300 kilometre underground slurry pipeline, which is still the largest uh, single transfer slurry pipeline in the world, a dedicated port facility in Corumba and a transshipment vessel. So this massive amount of infrastructure was built and it was operated successfully for 16 years as the third largest zinc mine uh, in the world. Now, what we've done in 2016, the mine was scheduled for closure and a very large um, uh, rehabilitation estimate was, was put in place with um, capping the waste dumps, capping the tailing dam, removing all of that infrastructure, all of that sunk capital and, um, and ultimately rehabilitating the site. We got interested in the project because we saw there was an opportunity to continue operations, but also facilitate rehabilitation. So applying what was previously an asset suitable or desirable by the majors, by, by very large companies, because it was such a big producer, and saying, well, you know, as a smaller company, we could take on this asset and continue the operations on a smaller scale, but also facilitate rehabilitation in doing that. So the, the operations that we do are not necessarily um, desired by the previous owner because they have uh, smaller, you know, lower um, hurdle rates and that sort of thing as well. However, there's still economic potential there, and ultimately you can provide that benefit uh, as well. So I'll, I'll give you a snapshot of what we've achieved to date. You can see the graph on the right-hand side. We we have operations uh, outlined to 2030. I can I can tell you there's there's a significant amount of phosphate mineralization on the site, which will ultimately bring it well past 2030 as well. But um, in terms of our zinc and lead operations, we see a very strong pathway to 2030. Now, what do we actually do? At the century mine so what why do we provide this benefit this is obviously a, a plan view satellite image of the site we've basically zoomed in on the mining lease area here so this is our deposit you can see with my highlighter here the century tailing stand here so um this this deposit as i said remember there was 120 million tons in the original ore body that's located up here the ore body which is now exhausted however when they built that they ran a throughput model through the plant 
So 12% zinc in the original ore body only achieved sort of low 70s recoveries. And they left us with a beautiful ore body in the tailings dam, which when you think about tailings as an ore body, well, it's already mined, it's already crushed, it's ground, it sits at surface with no cutoff grade, no strip ratio, and we, we use hydraulic mining. We literally mine it with a hose. So you're, you might have a lower grade than a typical in situ ore body, but your costs are about a tenth of the cost to, to mobilise it and reprocess it, assuming you know there is, there's economic value in it. So what we've done, uh, we acquired the mine in 2017 and we restarted operations. So we used all of that sunk capital uh, and we're reprocessing these tailings at the moment. So we used the evaporation dam water to hydraulically line the tailings, pump that back up through the to this little, it looks like a very little green um, uh, processing plant here. I can tell you that that uh, sort of green blip there is about 250 metres long. And we, we refloat as much concentrate or much zinc as we can into a concentrate. We pump it up the slurry pipeline all the way to the port at Karumba and we and we sell the, um, the concentrate around the world. Now, while, while it's fantastic to be able to say we're generating an economic return um, from the operations and uh, and all the benefits to local communities and shareholders that come to that, we're actually also facilitating rehabilitation of the site. So as most people be aware, in Queensland, uh, bonding, environmental bonding and rehabilitation is, is a calculated measure based on surface area of disturbance. So as a mine site puts down tailings dams and evaporation dams and waste dumps, uh, you, your bond grows and your rehabilitation requirement grows as well. It's X dollars per hectare for a tail dam, Y dollars per hectare for a waste dump, that sort of thing. So for us, as we said, we, we use the, the evaporation dam water, we hydraulically mine the tailings. Ultimately, all this area of disturbance ends up back in the original pit. So the tailings that we produce go back into the pit and we rehabilitate the site by a subaqueous deposition, which is really the, the most preferred mechanism of rehabilitation, shrinking that surface area of disturbance. The, the economic returns that we are generating, which are significant, we, we generated a $32 million in EBITDA last quarter alone from this operation. We're actually, the, this operation as a tailings reprocessing operation uh, is the 13th largest zinc producer in the world. Uh, there are there are 260 odd operating zinc mines in the world. So think about it, a tailings operation being one of the top uh, zinc mines in the world. It shows you that value and that potential um, that can be there. So those economic returns allow us to facilitate the rest of the rehabilitation on the site. And principally, that's for the three waste dumps. So the southern dump here, which has been capped and rehabilitated and signed off as best in class rehabilitation for a semi-arid environment. The western dump is 50% done and the northern dump hasn't been touched yet uh, uh, to date. So we're able to facilitate that rehabilitation or what we call economic rehabilitation, but by continuing operations uh, as well. So uh, certainly value add and you, you know, you're, you're creating more value out of, this, um, uh, out of this mine site, which was due to be closed. There are a number of small in situ deposits as well, which we fully plan to exploit. We, we're bringing Silver King online uh, in 2022, much smaller than the original big zinc ore body. But again, they provide that continued value add. And, and for us, we, we see it as a really important demonstration here of, of improving uh, the mining industry, uh, mining industry's social license to operate. So really, you know, gone are the days where you can put down large tailings dams and massive open pits and massive amounts of infrastructure and not have rehabilitation solutions uh, in place for them, um, whether it's during the, the life of the mine or post the life of the mine. This sort of activity of tailing through processing, shrinking that surface area of disturbance over time, it provides a mechanism actually, we believe, for larger companies to, um, to work with smaller companies who are focused on rehabilitation and provide that support. So for example, we acquired the asset off MMG back in 2017. Now MMG actually paid New Century $46.6 million to, uh, to divest the asset. And that really, that 46.6 million was used as uh, effectively covering the costs uh, until we got back into operation. So they were covering the budgeted rehabilitation, the budgeted care and maintenance costs that they had 
over a three year period. Uh, and we were able to use those to fund um, fund the asset and fund the, the housekeeping of the asset until we re-established the operations. We were able to re-establish the operations a lot faster uh, than we all thought, which was wonderful. Uh, and now we've replaced that environmental bond um, for MMG. So for, for MMG as a big company, they were looking at closing this mine site and, for example, capping the tailings dam. Now, the direct costs of capping the tailings dam alone were budgeted at $160 million. So the overall site rehabilitation cost was going to be three, four, five hundred million million over an extended period of time. So for us, you know, you know, as, a, as a commercial agreement that they paid, they paid New Century nearly $50 million, yes, that's a cost. But we've been able to demonstrate, and we are doing it right now, that we can continue to generate returns from the asset and facilitate that rehabilitation cost. So obviously a big win-win for, for MMG and for New Century and, and, and New Century shareholders and, and the whole model around economic rehabilitation. So I'll take you through some um, some uh, snapshots of the, uh, of the operation now, uh, just to give you a view of the scale here. So this is our deposit. You know, it's a one and a half metres across and two and a half metres long. And we use these hydraulic miners uh, here. Literally, it's a high pressure hose, 40 bar pressure. And we remobilize these tailings, just running up uh, lines along here. And the tailings flow on to a pumping station here. And as I said, they're pumped all the way back up to the site, uh, up to the existing processing plant. Simple, uh, there is an art form to tailings um, movement and, and uh, hydraulic mining but it's low cost. It's about a tenth of the cost of a traditional mining operation uh, there. And you can see here, this is a snapshot of the infrastructure uh, that we have in place as well. So this is one of the key opportunities with economic rehabilitation and, and tailings reprocessing is you, you invariably are able to acquire a vast amount of sunk capital. So your hurdle rate is much lower if you think about it from an economic perspective. You know, you're not having to build a processing plant or or even, um, you know, slightly offside to that, you're on a mine site, you're not having to get a permit. Uh, you might have power, water, infrastructure in place there. So all the hurdles that are required to produce that first tonne of metal are gone. And that's the hardest one to produce. As a traditional miner, the first tonne or the first ounce is the hardest one. After that, it's so much easier because uh, you've spent all that effort there. So uh, focusing on economic rehabilitation, you're naturally always... Uh, involved in the second ton or the third ton, or obviously um, uh, plenty after that, but you can acquire all this sunk capital for nothing and get a big operation up and running. So that's the that's the mine site uh, facility there, and you can see our port, even our port facility is is quite simply it's massive. Um, uh, so this this um, shed alone can take eighty thousand tons of concentrate. They used to produce a million tons per annum of concentrate through this system. We now produce something in the region of sort of three, 350,000 tonnes of concentrate. So there's excess capacity for us to do other things. But we own all the logistics infrastructure and we operate it the same way. So new cent the Century Mine really has become a fantastic case study for economic rehabilitation. Uh, it is uh, 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 generating some fantastic economic returns, 150 to $200 million EBITDA at the moment. We've had a 23% reduction in the environmental bonding required already to date. So it's gone from $240 million down to nearly $180 million. I believe we're the only mine site in Queensland, the only operating mine in Queensland that's ever had a reduction in its bonding requirement while in operation. Uh, so fantastic achievement there from the team. We run Australia's largest ever hydraulic mining operation and, and really, it's one of Australia's largest ever rehabilitation operations as well. So fantastic effort by the New Century team uh, and, a, and a, real, a really fantastic case study in what the mining industry can achieve uh, if it puts its mind to it. Because the applications are, are massive. You know, if there's economic value in a tailings dam or small and, and or smaller mineralisation uh, on a site, there's a great opportunity to continue those operations at a smaller scale and facilitate rehabilitation at the same time. I want to quickly turn to Mount Lyle now. So we, we've spent um, four or five years now uh, working very hard, establishing Century as a, as a major zinc producer and, and economic rehabilitation um, story. 
And uh, for all that effort, we've decided to do it again. We're going to do it down at Mount Lyle. Now, Mount Lyle, um, many people may know it, many people not may not. It has an amazing history uh, from Australian mining legacy. So we started, the mine was started up in around 1890. It's been running for 120 odd years. It was actually, uh, it's been a major copper producer for Australia. Uh, someone told me the other day it was the, the most prolific copper producer in the British Empire in the early 1900s. It was only superseded uh, by by um, uh, Mount Isa in the 1950s, actually. So big copper history, big copper operation there. Similar to Century, a vast amount of sunk capital in place, uh, you know, established infrastructure, underground, my, uh, the permitted, has a tailing stand, uh, has power, water, all those sort of good things there. Produces a very clean copper concentrate. And really exciting for us, really important, is that it's 100% renewable energy. So if and when we restart the mine, we'll talk about why it's not running in a sec. If and when we restart it, it is green copper. We're producing copper uh, from renewable energy, so hydroelectric power sources um, from Tasmania as well. Um, now, the, the legacy there is real, I should say. Um, the, the, if I just go back, the, for the first 80-odd years of the operations at Mount Lyle, tailings were put straight down the river. So a terrible environmental legacy. It's probably, probably the worst um, mining legacy in Australian history, in my opinion. I'm, there's lots of other examples, but it's a terrible legacy. So those tailings for 80 years were put down the Queen River into the King River, and they've spread out in a small delta in uh, in Macquarie Harbour there. And you, I'm sure many people on this call have been to Queenstown. They would have seen the uh, the Red Rivers there, which is just an environmental disaster. And similarly, they did have a smelter on site um, up until about, I think, 1960, 1970. That smelter would produce sulphur dioxide. It would mix with, um, with um, water droplets of water vapour in the air, would produce acid rain. And it would just cover it covered the area. So a lot of the trees, a lot of the uh, vegetation has been destroyed uh, in the region. It's only just now starting to grow back. So th there's no, there hasn't been a smelter operation there for nearly 50 years. So that vegetation is starting to grow back. But the legacies are real uh, at at um, at Mount Lyle. But there's also an opportunity for rehabilitation to occur. You think about the tailings that are in the river. Well, they're also 100 year old tailings. They contain significant mineralisation in them as well. So anyone who's prepared to work with the Tasmanian government, the, the Tassie government owns the legacy. They own all the pre-1999 legacy. Um, yeah, there's an opportunity there to reclaim those tailings, reprocess them, put them in the, the certified um, uh, tailings dam that is on the mine site. The tailings dam on the mine site is absolutely fine. Um, it was more the, the historical operations that put it down the river. Conscious of time, I'll quickly run through the opportunity here at Mount Lyle from an economic perspective. So it actually has run, uh, for example, the Indian uh, group Vedanta has owned the asset for the last, uh, since 1999, was operated profitably uh, through to 2014, producing nearly 30,000 tonnes of copper, 20,000 ounces of gold per annum. And they were generating around $70 million a year out of the asset. Uh, the reason they shut down was actually because of safety issues. So they, in, in 2013, they had uh, really amounts to poor safety management and poor systems resulted in two incidents that caused three fatalities on the mine site. So they were shut down. Uh, and then a long story short is they decided to put the thing up for sale uh, and they haven't had paid a lot of attention to it uh, since then. New Century was able to acquire the mine um, from a very, um, uh, very innovative structure uh, via a deferred and capped royalty structure. And we see a great opportunity to restart the operations uh, but via the underground and the open pits that are still there and a significant amount of mineralisation that is on the site. But in doing that, we can also facilitate rehabilitation uh, there as well. For example, even the existing tailings dam that is there, and as I said, the, the tailings dam has a perfect history of compliance that, that, that's on the site. There's actually a reasonable amount of pyrite in that tailings dam. If you go back to the 1960s, 1970s and 80s, they used to produce two products from the site. One was a clean copper con and the other was a clean pyrite con and it would be uh, exported and sold to, for example, to Japan and they used to, it to make magnets out of as well. Now, that operation hasn't been done um, for the last 25 odd years. Pyrite, there's an economic value there, not just in the pyrite itself, but remnant copper, cobalt, gold and silver. So you can float that pyrite out of the tailings dam 
reduce that economic value and, and obviously exploit that. But at the same time, you're removing the source of acid mine drainage from the site. So getting rid of that pyrite completely from the site and from the region is ultimately the sulfur disappears, which means you can't form sulfuric acid from the operation. So we, um, Mount Lyle is, is, a bit, is a bit of a flip on Century. Century is a very large tailings operation with a small in situ. Mount Lyle is more a very large in situ operation with a small tailings operation. But they both have the same, uh, I guess, benefits and ethos uh, where we're restarting operations on a smaller scale than what they were previously using all of that sunk capital on the site. But, you know, that enables it to provide that net benefit in terms of rehabilitation of these old legacy sites because the, the mineralization is still significant. The environmental issues are also significant, but the best thing possible for all these sites is that they're operating because when they're operating, they're generating returns. Those returns can be used and invested in that rehabilitation and all the community benefits that come with that. I'll stop there. Uh, Glenn and team, um, I'm conscious I'm already over time and, and um, I hope uh, people want to ask some good questions as well. So thank you very much uh, for listening and um, obviously check out the New Century Resources website uh, if you'd like to know uh, some more information. Oh, thanks very much, uh, Patrick. That was, uh, yeah, an excellent presentation. Um, and I found, I found it fascinating having um, sort of really been interested in this area for, for quite a while, the idea of actually trying to do this economic, you know, do economic rehabilitation, extract value, as you say, and also uh, get a good environmental uh, benefits. It's a bit of a cliche, but it's, I guess it's the, it's the win-win, um, which I try not to use, but it's a great example of that. Now, I just encourage people to put some questions, uh, unless I'm missing something, I can't see any questions in the Q&A uh, chat at the moment. So we've got a few minutes. Um, I think we can go till probably around about five past the hour if you're not in central, if you're not in central Australia, uh, that'll be 25 too. I guess I just to kick things off, Patrick, I did have a, have a question I just wanted to ask you. I mean, at the, at the beginning of your presentation, you talked about, you know, an organisation like yours having lower hurdle rates than, than bigger organisations. And that, that makes you just a little bit more I, I interpreted, a bit more adaptable and a bit easier to, to get projects like this, uh, uh, like this, this going. Do you, do you see this sort of continuing into the future, the, um, the smaller, more, um, I guess, more mobile, uh, uh, adaptable organisations and companies might be, might be the ones like, like yourself that will be able to actually take advantage of uh, economic rehabilita rehabilitation? Uh, absolutely. I, I mean, I think it's the, it's the reason that it works. You, you, quite simply, BHP and Rio, uh, if, they're going, if they're going to invest in continuing an operation, well, ultimately, that operation uh, has to compete with the, you know, the new darlings of their portfolio, which have you know, whatever amazing returns uh, that, that are in place. Uh, as an industry, though, I think we need to get more runs on the board. We need to get more new centuries out there to show that it is socially acceptable for large companies to, uh, to ultimately transfer liability. Now, there's, there's obviously various ways and means on doing that, you know, to making sure that it's done right. Um, but it's a, it's a huge opportunity um, as much as anything else because there is no mine in the world that gets 100% recovery on the first pass. You know, that, the 80-20 the, the principle is alive and well in the mining industry. You, you do all the effort, you get 80% of the value uh, for 20% of that, 20% of the effort there. Now, that means you're typically leaving 20% of the value behind and the bigger the mine is, the bigger that 20% is. And, and we we look at sort of mining as a function of risk. Um, now, if, if you're a traditional uh, explore, develop, operate miner, which, you know, let's face it, 99% of the, the of companies are, there's so much risk involved in that. If you think about the amount of money you have to expend to explore to even find something, then you would hope it's economic. Then you have to hope you can get it permitted. Then you have to hope you can time the market to actually get it, raise funds to get it developed. You, you, you're sort of talking about a thousand to one probabilities in terms of that first drill hole you put in. For New Century, we look at it and say, well, 
A, we don't know much about expiration, so we're not we're not going to pretend we can discover that ore body. But B, there, there's so much value still left behind it by the industry. We don't necessarily need to go out and spend so much effort discovering it. What we should be doing is cultivating companies that are focused on the other side of the life cycle uh, and saying, all right, we're going to be focused on that rehabilitation, operating on a lean and mean basis and generating, continuing to generate those returns and those benefits. Because, you know, we, if I think about New Century, we're a company that didn't officially exist at the start of 2017. We acquired the asset, we vended it into a listed vehicle and we're away now. So we, we didn't exist at the start of 2017. By the end of 2018, we'd restarted the Century Mine. By the end of 2019, so within 15 months of, of, of being born, we were one of the top 15 zinc producers in the world. You, you, you just you can't do that under an, any yeah. other economic model. So there, there's massive value in it for the mining industry, but the benefit is, is obviously uh, for the environment as well. You, you create that mutual benefit, not just actually for the environment, but by all the stakeholders that, that surround these mines, all the local communities that surround these mines, you know, economic and environmental benefits that occur. Yeah, look, that's that's great. I'm still I'm still encouraging people to ask questions. Uh, if you if you don't have any questions, I've certainly got a lot of questions to ask ask Patrick. But I, I mean, I think that gee, the point you made there was really interesting. The fact that um, you know, there's no. Uh, there's no uh, virgin deposit that could be up and running within 15 or 18 months, as you said there. But that that what you have done there with New Century Resources and uh, is is just a, a like a step change in time frame compared to a normal ore body. I mean, one of the other things that you mentioned, I think if I picked it up, was that because Century uh, had a throughput model, they were really trying to focus on on throughput, and that of course left a a reasonable grade in the um, in the in the ore body uh, that uh, that that was a characteristic I guess which was helpful because you you then had a had a reasonable grade in the ore body and but as you said a much lower operating cost. I'm yeah, like, actually, absolutely. Patrick, I'm, I'm rather than answer my we do have a question that's just come in from 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 Martin Breed um, from uh, Flinders University he said. Can you please talk about your perspectives on the potential trade-offs between ecological and economic rehabilitation? Good, good question. I mean, for mine sites, I'll, I'll stick to mining. Obviously, as the uh, and um, and mine sites as the as the focal point here. Every opportunity is different when we when you think about a legacy mine site. Every one of them is different. Some of them. Uh, there might not be an economic amount of mineralization in the tailing stand, so you don't you don't have this opportunity. So you've got to do that. Um, we could focus on ecological rehabilitation there. Um, the the trade off really around you know, we think about economic rehabilitation versus just straight rehabilitation or ecological rehabilitation. Uh, I think is is um, is several fold benefit towards economic rehabilitation. One of the things that uh, mine sites typically struggle with in terms of rehab is actually who's paying the bill is the cost of doing it so things get done faster when they're alongside an existing operation things get done better as well so no one's running the thing on a smell of an oily rag and it's not just that but it's actually also the quality of the the human resource you can bring to these operations so i think about big companies that you know, no one goes to work for a big company, BHP, Rio, MMG, whoever it is, and just wants to then end up at the site that's closing. You know, so you're typically your best minds are on the next world leading deposit. Now that's a that's a generalization, but to be able to keep the operation going and showing an extended mine life, you can attract good people to that as well. Good people with smart ideas. And that's across the board, whether it's operations, rehabilitation or anything like that. So you're you're creating a product which is far more exciting for, for people to be at as well. And that ultimately can lead to better outcomes from an environmental perspective. But I, I certainly don't want to paint a picture that every mine site should just reprocess its tailings and everything will be fine because that's quite simply not the case. Uh, but these particularly larger mine sites have, have huge environmental footprints they have very large burdens that it's either on the company or for, for abandoned mine sites it's on the state governments or the federal government 
Um, but there are better ways to do things. There are uh, there are ways to create value while also providing the benefit as well. Okay, thanks, Patrick. Look, we just have one uh, one other question. Um, maybe if you could uh, just uh, give a give a brief answer to this. Um, it's just that uh, this is from uh, Mohammed. He said, "Do you normally generate value from tailings treatment as part of an NPV for an overall mining operation? Can you briefly explain the twenty one percent value?" Uh, not, not sure the 21% value where that is, um, but you, obviously for our shareholders, they are they are investing in New Century for an economic return. There are uh, understandably non-economic benefits that they're, while they're also investing, but principally the way our, our market capitalization, our share price would improve is by generating economic returns for shareholders as well. So it's not a loss-making uh, enterprise, it's a profitable enterprise. So. Uh, everything we look at does have to generate a positive NPV. Absolutely, absolutely. So, but we we can see that happening while also offsetting costs associated with rehabilitation as well. So, tailings, yeah, we we are ultimately facilitating the transfer of tailings back into the pit. At the moment, we're just generating you know nearly two hundred million dollars EBITDA by doing that per annum. Okay, that's that's great. Look, look, Patrick, I'd just like to thank you very much again. Thanks very much for the presentation. As I said, look, I found it really fascinating and, and just wish you all the, the best with New Century Resources and certainly with Mount Lyle. Uh, and we'll, uh, as far as the CRC is concerned, we'd like to just understand more about what you're doing. So th thanks very much again. And I'm sure I speak on everybody that's uh, that's attended. Yeah, and thank you, Glenn. I, I just want to give a a shout out to you, yourself and to Brian and the and the CRC team there. As I was we were chatting about previously, the, you know, the the foundations of New Century were born because of the research houses that we have in Australia. So you know, my background personally is through West Australian School of Mines um, and through the Department of Mineral Economics as well. So being able to um, show or, or or develop these have these research houses develop competency in Australia and and grow people. Is really the reason that New Century exists, to be honest. So, um, yeah, it's fantastic to see uh, the CRC promote these sort of things uh, into the future. That's great. Oh well, thanks, thanks very much, uh, thanks very much again, Patrick. And uh, we'll um, uh, just move on to the next section now. So I'm going to talk. I think I've got about five minutes, but I'm going to make this pretty short. Um, because we do want to talk about the foundational um, projects. Uh, am I sharing the right screen? Ah, there we go. So, yes, yeah, so I do want to talk about the foundational projects that have occurred within this program. And I know that we've been talking about that with the in the other programs, but there's actually been seven national solutions. And um, what we've asked each of the program leaders to do is do a short video on their presentation. So we're going to run those videos. The other. And then at the end, there'll be a, uh, about um, seven or eight minutes to just to, to have some questions. So we have the presenters online to, to have some questions. I just wanted to say that there's only one thing that I wanted to say is that basically the first one is actually um, called, it's related to uh, trying to develop a system model. Uh, and so that's going to be presented by Claire, uh, by Claire Coate. And then underneath that, there is uh, various other foundational projects that are that are essentially feeding into that that system model. So that's the sort of the structure that we have here. Um, and Claire's going to kick off and talk about uh, about the integrated system model she's been developing, and that will then feed in. Workshop five. Uh, the other foundational projects will work into workshop six, where we'll, we'll be actually looking at sustainable supply chains. So if I can just get um, our organizers to present Claire's video and then we'll just run through the others one after the other after that. Hello everybody, here's my quick overview of project F31. I will share my screen and talk to the slides.
All right, the title of the project was Integration of Biophysical Aspects in Mine Closure Planning, and my co-workers are from my team here at the Sustainable Minerals Institute, Robin Crystal, Consuelo Garcia Zavala, and Pascal Asmussen. The objective I would would want first to acknowledge the traditional custodians across all the lands on which we live and work and we pay respects to elders both past and present. The objective of the project initially was reasonably straightforward as we thought. Um, it started from the recognition that mine closure planning, the process of mine closure planning requires input from a range of disciplines and need to address aspects related to a lot of biophysical aspects, whether it be surface water, groundwater, landform design, geochemical assessment, et cetera, et cetera. So it is usually supported by a lot of technical studies, but there is no way to link those technical studies, even though the results from one might impact on the outcomes of another, but they are treated independently. And the relationships between the biophysical aspects and the technical studies are not articulated. That means if anything changes in the mine closure plan, most of the time we need to redo all the technical studies or repeat them or rerun models. So the hypothesis behind the project was surely there is a better way to do this and there is a way to link all that work and to look at it at system level rather than always be buried in the details. So it was very much about developing a system approach to looking at mine closure planning. Um, when we wrote the proposal, our objectives we thought were reasonably um, straightforward. We were going to look at whether it was possible to define system level variables and the relevant relationships between them in terms of feedback loops or interdependencies. We received feedback to look at the source pathway receptor framework and to assess whether that would help with looking at closure plan in a more comprehensive way. And we were going to provide an illustration of what it would look like uh, by building some prototype. And we had ideas around the basing the prototype in Queensland because we had collected a lot of information for a lot of mines in the region. So that was the initial view of what the project should achieve. Um, the methodology included an in-depth literature review. So we gathered a lot of information from that review which was based essentially on environmental systems, ecology, some work on food supply, but we also looked at potential applications in mining and whether there had been any work done on system level application in mining. We also gathered findings from a range of projects, so including some foundation project from the CRC, particularly F24 and CRC SAFE, that included an in-depth review of recent environmental impact studies in Queensland. And on the topic of environmental impact studies, which is irrelevant because that's where a lot of information about biophysical aspects is, is gathered. So that's what provides baseline assessment. CSRO has done a lot of work as part of bioregional assessment on developing what they call causal network of um, stresses, uh, drivers of changes, processes, what they call endpoints. So it was worth looking at what work CSRO had done because it does inform the ability of the source pathway receptor framework to be applicable to what we had aimed to achieve. Um, the findings from the literature review were quite enlightening. So they, they, they well aligned in terms of the tasks that need to be done to develop a system level approach, but there were two points that were absolutely crucial. Who are the intended users? And what is the degree of granularity of the system's outcome that we need to address? So we spent a lot of time thinking about this. And what we found is when we looked at our initial objectives, they did not take into account those two crucial points. We were heavily focused on how would we apply a system level approach, but we hadn't done much thinking about what it should achieve and what structure it should have. So we went back to square one, looking at those two crucial points. And then when we try to answer this question, it was quite clear that the structure of the system, it's actually three things because of the different intended users that we have. First, what we call tier one is we try and communicate to external stakeholders what the closure plan is about. So we would look at tools that are quite high level and are heavily focused on communication of key aspects, key objectives. 
Then there is what we need to do at companies level. So the various teams at company level who are involved in developing the closure plan, what do they need to talk to each other and to ensure we've considered all aspects and those aspects are clearly identified as being related to each other. So here we would look at some graphical models that describe the system elements and capture the in interactions and you'd gather feedback from a lot of people within the companies. And then finally, there's the one thing we were thinking about initially is how do we integrate those technical studies? And really, this is work that is done in terms of communicating with the consultants or the service providers who do those technical studies. So what kind of framework do we need to better manage that piece of work, all those technical studies that are done? And really, in most companies, that would be done by an environmental team or a closure team. So what tools do they need to facilitate com communication with the consultants? And this is a lot more detailed and, and something that is not used by everybody in the company, but specifically the closure team. So what we find with the, um, as we go from a lot of people, except from external stakeholders to just environmental team and the consultant, the degree of granularity changes dramatically. And then the tool that's required would not be the same. So based on this, we actually reviewed what the prototype should look like. And really a prototype should be about providing illustration examples or what the system level approach would look like for each group of intended users from tier one to tier three. And that's what we've done. We are now at the stage of the project where we, we finalize those aspects and we've got examples of tier one to tier three tools, but we need feedback. So we've organized a workshop, it's workshop number five. And during that workshop, we'll be creating feedback through some activities around those tiers and, and just really interested in gathering people's thoughts and views about what these prototypes should look like. So we will have an activity around tier one, the one that is aimed at external stakeholder. We will have an activity related to the company level tool. Uh, and explore what kind of guidance and what kind of process would be needed to develop this sort of tool. So we'll go through details in each of the tool and just uh, seek feedback uh, on those aspects. And we will provide a discussion on tier three. From a research perspective, tier three is probably the most challenging because we actually, it, it is quite complex linking those various technical studies uh, with that doing an enormous amount of work. So it's about finding that level right and I think it will require a bit more thinking and definitely a lot of feedback so please join us in that workshop if you're interested in those aspects um, because we are very keen to hear your views on this um, thank you very much good morning I'm going to present the aims methods and main findings today from project 3.2 transforming disparate approaches to remote sensing and monitoring to industry best practice I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners across all the lands on which we live and work and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. The project overview, we have four main project objectives that were from the outset, and that's to determine what industry and regulators need or want to be monitored using remote sensing through sur surveys and connecting user groups. And the user groups are um, the mining companies, the um, SMEs that are working in the mining industry, um, regulators, as well as um, researchers from academia. Um, and other more secondary components were to determine what platforms or technologies are currently being used to achieve monitoring, to determine what platforms and technologies exist beyond that and what their potential may be. And then lastly, to identify the most appropriate tools for potential criteria or indicators and develop a research roadmap. So the two key deliverables were firstly, a state of the art review of remote sensing and monitoring capabilities, which um, Adam Cross from Curtin University is leading. And that's to enable end users to easily understand um, or to give them a better understanding of how rem the remote sensing and monitoring field, um, how remote sensing is used in the monitoring field. And that's been underpinned by a survey um, of CRC partners and a literature review, and is currently being drafted into a journal manuscript. And the second deliverable was a roadmap of research priorities, which is also underpinned by the survey um, of the, the wider industry and includes a research plan to develop recommendations on how to incorporate remote sensing technologies or to come up with best practice standards um, um, for monitoring of mine sites and regulatory frameworks.
The project team comprises of a research team with Adam Cross from Curtin University, Peter Erskine and Lorna hernandez Inton from um, the University of Queensland and myself and Dave Lowensteiner from the Supervising Scientist branch um, of DOOR. And then the steering group, um, Kirsty Beckett is the end user sponsor, end use sponsor. And then we've got other representatives from the mining sector, as well as SMEs in that sector and the government regulators, as well as Geoscience Australia. So today I'm going to focus on um, the method and the, the key findings for the roadmap for guidelines and standards um, in the remote sensing of mine land. So the method was underpinned by a survey of CRC time stakeholders and the wider industry using a questionnaire, which was um, we're very grateful was reviewed by the project steering group. And then there was um, that was made up of pre predominantly of an online survey, but also um, people could self select to for a follow up interview, which gave us greater insights. And that ethics approval was obtained through the University of Queensland. So the key results um, the online survey, there were 53 responses in total and um, 22 people chose to do further interviews, which was a great response. Um, the, the most respondents came from Western Australia were in the, um, and were in, the, um, in terms of, of um, mineral sector, iron ore, and the type of mining was open cut and um, predominantly people were working in monitoring or man managing rehabilitation areas. With the um, interviews, the, the key focus there was on issues with current monitoring and there was logistic issues, mine capability and uptake, regulation, compliance and governance and the need for consistency across sectors. Some key findings so far as a result of both the literature review and the draft manuscript and the um, survey was that the Australian industry appears to be underrepresented in the global scientific literature um, relating pro, um, to remote sensing of the mine environment. And the international scientific literature does demonstrate that remote sensing is useful in the mining industry, but it provides very little insight in how the Australian mining industry is using remote sensing because um, very little is being published. So some of the key research areas to improve current monitoring practices, really high importance to monitor identified from the survey was vegetation composition, um, erosion landform and tailings. Um, there was a, a, there's some other um, key other areas there, but things that should be monitored differently include fauna, vegetation structure composition and slope stability. And then this um, need to standardise monitoring protocols that use best practice across a range of areas. And we're currently getting feedback from our steering group on, on this road research roadmap. And this is our draft research roadmap. Just like to point out two key features of it is um, how we can explore different um, science, stakeholder scientific models. Um, across different jurisdictions and pick the best components of those as maybe a way forward for developing standards. Um, and another key feature is integration of remote monitoring technologies. Um, for example, um, integrating remote sensing um, methods um, with things like ED, eDNA or omics. Thank you. CSE Time Project 3.3, it's called Mine Site Water, Options for Extracting Value from Open Pits. And the project looked at hydrological processes and closure options for below water table open pit mines. The research team included Flinders University, the University of Queensland, University of Western Australia and the Chem Centre, and a final report from the project has recently been completed. When mines are dewatered, the, the reduction in groundwater level creates a drawdown cone surrounding the mine. The size of that cone can extend for several kilometres and will be affected by the aquifer permeability, aquifer thickness and storativity, but also the pumping rate and the mine depth. Key issues here are the depletion of groundwater, not just in the vicinity of the mine, but sometimes for several kilometres surrounding the mine and the potential impacts that that may have on springs, rivers and other groundwater dependent ecosystems. On mine closure, 
that area of reduced groundwater level doesn't immediately decrease. In fact, it continues to spread outwards for a number of years. This, so this means that even after mine closure, groundwater dependent ecosystems that may have been impacted during mine life can continue to be impacted. But more than this, areas where there were no impacts on ecosystems may begin to feel impacts many years after the mine has closed. If the pits are backfilled, then the water table will eventually recover to its original level, but that recovery may take several hundreds of years. If pits are not backfilled, then if the precipitation rate is less than the evaporation rate from the pit, the water table will eventually stabilise, but will never recover. That is, the water table will stabilise at a level lower than the original groundwater level. The final pit water level will largely be determined by the evaporation rate, but the rate of filling of the pit will depend on the aquifer properties. One of the issues is that pit lake models are rarely properly linked to groundwater models. And this means that the slow rise in pit lake water level is usually not properly modelled. One of the key issues for the pit lake water and solute balance is that the water balance will change over time. It will do that because the groundwater inflow to the pit lake will decrease over time as the pit fills but also because of climate variability, groundwater inflows, surface water inflows, precipitation and evaporation will change in time. The final pit lake salinity, um, when the groundwater recovers, will be strongly linked to the ratio of the groundwater inflow, groundwater and surface water inflow, to the evaporation rate. If evaporation rate is high, then the pit lake can eventually become highly saline. Other key determinants of pit lake water quality are runoff from pit walls and solutes that that may entrain, and whether or not the pit itself is used for disposal of waste rock. These diagrams show some of the final scenarios for pits that are strongly connected to groundwater systems and pits that are predominantly surface water connected. Key issues involve the time to reach steady state for the groundwater fed systems. Short term fluctuations can be important for both groundwater and surface water fed systems as rainfall and evaporation change over time. Another key issue is the implications for downstream water supplies, uh, particularly for cases two, three and four for groundwater connected pits and for cases two and three for surface water connected pits where outflows from pits make their way into creeks and streams. For the case where the, the pit becomes a groundwater sink, uh, high salinities can build up. That can uh, lead to density dependent flow where the water becomes highly saline and hence denser and heavier than the regional groundwater and can move off site through density dependent flow. There are a number of potential uses of pits, including reservoirs for recreation and fisheries. Water quality issues are key for many of these uses, including potential changes in water quality over time. Other issues that haven't been examined in our report include wall stability, proximity to communities, and other economic and social considerations. We also discuss a number of innovative approaches that can be used as part of mine closure. These include things like rapid filling of pits to, to very quickly uh, submerge potential uh, oxidizing minerals, um, engineered barriers that can limit the lateral extent of groundwater drawdown around pits. Managed aquifer recharge we think has a lot of potential. Managed aquifer recharge is currently practiced in a number of pits but it's not specifically optimised for its closure benefit and it has the potential to return water levels to the new stable position much more rapidly. There's also potential to 
engineer pit backfill and evaporation rates to produce better outcomes. The diagram here on the right shows um, the use of what's called shade balls, which can be put on the surface of a pit and can greatly reduce the evaporation, which would result in the water level of the pit being higher than it might otherwise be. Other, innov other innovative approaches include the use of oxygen barriers, that might be a water cover, low permeability sediments, or it could be organic matter to uh, reduce oxygen levels. And there's a number of innovative water treatment options also. Finally, I'll just present the recommendations. I won't read them out, but leave you to read them yourself. Thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Jason Stevens, and I'm a research scientist in the Department of Biodiversity, Conservation and Attractions and the Program Leader of Kings Park Science. Today I would like to just give you an update on where we are at with the Foundation Project Returning Ecosystem Resilience. And in particular I'd just like to give you a short background um, of where we've got to, but I'd also like to take the opportunity to outline what the next steps are for broader engagement. In shaping this project, there have been two groups of people involved that I need to acknowledge and thank. The first was a research group that came together at the ideation concept stage. Um, they were really trying to understand where concepts around returning biodiversity to post mining landscapes sat within the, the CRC landscape. The second group that I'd like to acknowledge is the steering committee for this foundation project, which has around 15 representatives across industry and academia um, that have really helped to take this initial ideation concept uh, and focus it now around the, the broader theme of ecosystem resilience. For me, I guess the goals of the foundation project have really been to identify what the cross-sector priority knowledge gaps are and how we might map that to research approaches and opportunities to really address the major concerns around returning ecosystem resilience. There's some other aims that we'd like to try and achieve um, throughout this project um, and it's not just all around knowledge gap identification but it's around establishing partnerships, understanding if there are any barriers um, to adoption of current knowledge or new knowledge um, into operational practices and I'd like to wrap all of this up in, in a guiding document that really outlines the research pathways um, and mechanisms to translate research into on-ground practice and use it as a communication tool across the CRC. Returning ecosystem resilience sounds quite simple, but it's actually quite a complex theme uh, with interpretation of definitions and output requirements, you know, really dictated by the types of mining activity, regulatory requirements, where stakeholders are at in terms of their mining life cycle, but also the prior experiences and learnings that they've achieved along the way. Uh, because of this, um, the steering group has brought together many various different perspectives and we've spent some, some time trying to understand a process to identify areas where there is common alignment across industry and to separate that from really important, but I guess more individual stakeholder requirements in, in returning ecosystem resilience. So we needed to try and understand an, an alignment process. And for that, I guess where we landed was on a previously established framework developed by the West Australian Biodiversity Science Institute that captured, at least from a West Australian perspective, some industry, government and research perspectives around the key components to developing and assessing uh, completion criteria. And we frame that in a way about how that applied to returning resilient ecosystems. So at the steering group level, you know, we've specifically explored kind of the attributes component of that uh, continuum. So these are the things that can be quantified or tasks that really can be verified as being achieved. So things you can clearly point your finger to, to say that you're on the right track. Um, and we looked across the, the 70 attributes that are outlined in, in the document that sit underneath the eight 
um, aspects, which cover off on things from flora and vegetation right through to social and economic kind of thematic areas. So what we've been able to distill down at the steering group level is that there is varying levels of alignment across the aspects and attributes in the context of this project, which focuses on returning ecosystem resilience. However, however we have found some common areas of alignment. Um, those that fall under the aspects of ecosystem function and sustainability, flora and vegetation, had some pretty good alignment across uh, the 15 partners that contributed to this data set. We also identified some areas that didn't have strong alignment, those in the social and economic kind of area, which we, which we think are probably secondary factors going forward. We also had really strong alignment at specific attribute um, level. So now it's really around the next steps. Um, and we're looking to now check and validate if these findings align to the broader CRC community. Initially, we're proposing to run the same process of alignment, although this one has taken quite some time um, to develop uh, with, with the mining sector more broadly, which include companies in the MET sector, to really identify what the common areas are, but also to put some meat on the bones and identify what the knowledge gaps really are. We're planning to send out some engagement details around mid-December, mid uh, for briefing sessions and online engagement in mid to late Jan. We also hope to engage kind of the regulated community during this time, possibly through a parallel process, because the regulator voice is going to be really important in, in shaping the direction going forward. Finally, in early March, we want to bring all of this consolidated data together and take it to the research community to do two things. The first is to enable interactions uh, between industry and the relevant researchers that can really address these priority knowledge gaps. But also we want to be able to develop specific research programs and concepts that map to areas of industry alignment. So we're now beginning the reach out phase of this project and over the next few months uh, we hope to be able to deliver a document which will be able to frame uh, the research agenda in returning ecosystem resilience for the CRC. Thank you. I'm David Williams, University of Queensland. I'm going to talk about uh, the project, a systematic and systemic review of mine landform stability and its impact on transitioning for regional benefits. And really I want to uh, focus on uh, the fact that there are significant mine landform legacies with inadequate uh, stability and also an acceptable closure. This impacts the reputation and also leaves large financial liabilities for the industry. This project is really about creating a baseline. And it also talks about site climate, topography, and seismicity because we, we look at various sites across. Researchers, myself, Thomas Baumgartel, and Jason Stevens, and a large group of industry end users. So the mine sites considered, uh, there's a number of them, Kidston Gen X, New Century, New Ackland Mine, the Carter River Mine, a mine or various mines in the Hunter Valley, also the Trobe Valley, Sovereign Hill in Victoria, Canman 2, Collie, Beanup, and some of the satellite iron ore mines in the Pilbara, which have been closed. And we look at those sites for various reasons. I want to just consider in this short presentation one example, Kidston Gen X. There were two uh, low-grade gold open pits mined between 1985 and 2001. Wises Hill was first. The uh, waste rock from Wises Hill went into surface waste rock dumps that covered about 340 hectares to a typical height of about 36 metres. And Wises Tailings went into a surface TSF covering an area of about 310 hectares, an average height of about 15. All of the waste from the second or Aldridge pit went into Wises pit. The waste rock ended up from one end and thickened tailings gravity fed from the other. The rehab took place between 95 and 2001. It comprised storm release covers on the top of the waste rock dumps, and uh, these were revegetated. And then the wide encapsulation of barren waste rock was overdumped uh, with oxide waste and eerily seeded. The relatively benign tailings were directly revegetated. What the site looked like, 
uh, soon after closure. Waste rock dumps, TSF, and the two pits. Kids and Genix. Kids and gold mines were redeveloped by Placer, which brought out, uh, which was bought out by Barrick in 2006. Genix Power acquired the site in 2012. Genix constructed a 50 megawatt solar farm over about two thirds of the TSF in 2017. And this power uh, generated is transferred via the existing transmission line to the grid. Genix has commenced construction of a 250 megawatt pumped hydro project utilising the two pit voids. The expanded Wiser's pit footprint will be the upper reservoir and uh, Eldridge will be the lower one. Additional makeup water will come from the existing Copperfield Dam. This is a, uh, what it looks like in perspective. You can see the solar farm and the TSF and the outline of the pumped hydro upper reservoir on the expanded Wiser's pit and Eldridge pit in the foreground. Here's another couple of views of the solar farm and the pump storage, showing the enlarged uh, Wises uh, area and the uh, reservoir and Eldridge pit that will be pumped back up. So ongoing site management, the long lived solar farm and pump storage uh, projects will enable the ongoing management of poor quality seepage reporting at topographic low points around the toes of the waste rock dump and the TSF. The waste rock dump currently generates about 2.2% of average rainfall, uh, being about 800 millimetres, of which about 0.5% evaporates. 1.4% comes through the barren sides of the waste rock dump because they're not sealed. And only 0.5% comes through the store and release covers, which is the important figure. The TSF generates a lot more seepage, about 2.9% of rainfall, and 2.6% of that comes from net percolation uh, and on any ongoing drain down of the tailings. The waste facilities and slopes are well vegetated. Ground cover is generally greater than 80%, well above the 50% threshold to limit erosion. There's a couple of shots of the uh, poor quality seepage collection points, one from the TSF, and this other one showing the north waste drop dump seepage collection point. Revegetation on the solar farm, obviously the shrubs and trees have been cut back, the grass is maintained and mowed. And on the waste rock dump, a typical view of that uh, range of eucalypts, shrubs and grasses. So in conclusion, Kist and Gen X is arguably the best Australian example of mined landform stability, enabling a mine site to transition for regional benefits. In addition to adding value, Gen X will enable the ongoing management of this former mine site. It's a model for other value added repurposing of mine sites elsewhere. Thank you very much. Hello everyone, my name is Carolyn Oldham and I'm going to take, spend a, a few minutes telling you about the work we've been doing in a project where we set out to assess barriers to reduce environmental risk and we used acid and metalliferous drainage or AMD as a case study in this work. So as we talked to numerous stakeholders as we were setting up this project, there was a growing consensus that AMD impacts from operational and closed and legacy mines continues to grow and that strategies for AMD prevention or mitigation struggle to meet the evolving stakeholder expectations. And so this project set out to identify blind spots that may be preventing effective management of AMD and to identify opportunities to improve the business case for minimising AMD risk across the whole of the mining life cycle. And finally, to propose a roadmap for CRC time work on AMD. So AMD can be classified as a wicked problem. And a wicked problem is defined as a, a challenge where there are multiple stakeholders involved and those stakeholders have different values. And therefore they would approach the problem in very different ways. Wicked problems are known, it's known that for wicked problems, you can't use a classical linear project management type approach and that you have to use a much more consultative approach to come to be able to get any traction on solutions for the wicked problems. Um, these sorts of approaches have been used for about three decades and used successfully to, to get make some progress on the wicked problems. And this is the, the methodology that we used for this project. So we ran, um, we used a methodology called open space technology, where we ran stakeholder consultative workshops 
And we simply put a question out on the internet and distributed that question through all of our networks. And the question was, why has AMD been such an intractable issue and what can be done about it? We ran two virtual workshops spanning across all time zones. And in the end, we had 90 participants from 19 countries. Now, when the participants arrived, they were invited to pose a topic for discussion. We did not preset the agenda. They posed topics and then they could choose which discussion groups they would join. All of the discussions from all discussion groups were transcribed and then finally analysed for emerging themes. And that was the bulk of the work that we did for this program, project was the analysis of those discussion points and identifying the emerging themes. So where did we land? There were four broad clusters of um, themes and each of those themes had uh, issues and opportunities that were identified. I want to just re-emphasize that each of these green, um, yellow boxes had a whole um, spider web of um, discussion points from multiple discussion groups. And these were the themes that emerged. So under the understanding the science of AMD, the issue that was identified was a lack of scientific understanding or deposit knowledge. And the opportunity was to better quantify source control, remediation and value opportunities. That may be, seem obvious, but it was quite interesting to us um, going into the project to see whether the science was actually identified as a, as a key opportunity. And it was, um, but there were others. There was also a theme of standards and governance where the issue identified was the lack of clarity around accountability and values that were internal to a mining company. The opportunity for the CRC then was to improve standards, both internal and external standards, governance and regulation of environment and AMD specifically. With regard to enhancing the business case for AMD management, the issues were identified as poor decision making being due to unsuitable metrics, tools and models that were being currently being used. Also challenges aligning science and operations for decision making. And the opportunity that came up again and again here was to better define the long term objective. And the critical part there was to better define the residual risk associated with not managing well AMD impacts. And finally, there was a theme under engagement, communication and education. And the issue identified was the lack of comprehensive stakeholder engagement and collaboration. And the opportunities was to improve communication and collaboration and also educate and inform across professional groups. One of the key things to note here is that the stakeholders in this last yellow box were identified as both being internal stakeholders as well as external stakeholders. So internally to a company, it was how to get engagement and collaboration across teams, across project teams, across company teams, and how to educate and inform across those teams, as well as, of course, the important aspect of engaging external stakeholders. We set out, we were asked to create a roadmap. Now, my, the roadmap to me implies a linear progression like a, as a road. And I guess the more we looked at the discussion points, the more we realized this is more, this is a journey where many of the um, issues raised impacted other themes. And so there's so much interweaving of this work that I consider that probably to be the main challenge for the CRC, CRC is how to ensure that work done under one project informs the work done under another project. The other area that came through again and again is a really important and critical part um, is around engagement, communication and education. This, uh, this came out as being a foundational issue across all the other issues. It was raised again and again, and in particular about the internal stakeholder engagement and collaboration and communication. So I consider this to be one of the biggest areas of impact that the CRC could work on to tackle this problem. Okay, and that's where I'm going to leave it. Um, the final report on this project would be out soon and will be out soon, hopefully. And thank you for listening. Hello, everyone. My name is Rafael Picoretti. I'm a research mining engineer at Mining3. 
As other foundation projects in the CRC Time Program 3, we are trying to pavement future research, bringing innovation options at high risk points, increasing positive, positive uh, post closure legacy. In this case of this project, a further understanding of different geophysical impacts of different mine methods used today and how this impact may change if new methods are considered. Uh, the objective of this project is to understand what knowledge exists on the relationship between mine, mine methods, closure, uh, and post mining land use, evaluate conventional mine methods to identify closure challenges, evaluate novel mine methods to identify opportunities to change closure options, and highlight their own closure challenge. Investigate new opportunity for post mining land use for novel mine man methods and identify the opportunity to develop novel mine methods that enable alternative closure options. Uh, closure issues vary depend on mining methods, creating different geophysical challenges on surface and on the ground. On the other hand, mining methods depend on the geology of the ore deposit. Usually, the method is selected based on a pre feasibility study. And there is a limited way, it uh, limit ways uh, to change it once it's implemented. If the ability to close the mine, reuse the landscape, and contribute to the community are to become driving factors in selecting the mining method and mining operation, then they should also be considered in early stage in the decision making. So, what we could we think the way a mine method is decided? perhaps including the geophysical legacy issue as a more relevant factor in the feasibility study. Or what we, we could rethink the whole way a mine method could work, reducing the high amount of waste removed uh, and treated. Uh, in this methodology, a literature review was conducted and identified the most common geophysical impact. We used the methodology uh, of analysis based on a matrix approach known as the Rock Engineering System, developed by Professor John Hudson at the Imperial College uh, of London. Uh, we uh, use, uh, as a comparison, the most common uh, mine methods between surface on the ground and uh, the in-place mining as like novel approach for mining methods. And we want to compare those in a matrix that will allow to quantify the impact and bring a picture of the hazard per mining method. Uh, we uh, conducted a survey, and those are the results. Out of all the, of the surveys, we got like a 28% of respond of the, the survey that can be considered like a low adherency. And what it actually shows is that we, the, 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 the mining silos of knowledge is, is actually uh, actual thing uh, between departments in the same company uh, and uh, between uh, different mine methods, <clears throat> open pit and underground. Uh, as a, an observation, some of the comments we got out of the surveys that they didn't have the knowledge across different mine methods to assess the survey properly. So this number can be an indicative of the professionals that can have a crossover understanding in different uh, mine method impacts. This is quite interesting because it may show the percentage of people that they can take decisions in one mine method instead of the other one, based uh, on only what they know for a given method, and so having uh, options for for other ones may uh, decrease uh, risk. Uh, for the survey, survey, surface mine method, we, uh, we had like 22 items listed and uh, thir 13 had an average reply over 3.3 risk or what was considered like a strong impact. There were no impact between different surface mine methods and interesting enough, the soil pollution is for the lowest uh, risk. We had like a, a general average of 64.7 and there were like 40 items not filled in the survey. Uh, 
between both. The difference between uh, methods can indicate that the professional are more familiarized with one method than the other. Uh, in the underground mining method result, the out of the 22 items listed, the high impacts are related with water pollution and operational cost. There were differences between the different mine methods. And interestingly enough, again, the soil pollution is scored the lowest uh, for underground as well. We had an uh, average of 37 up to 47, uh, comp uh, significant lower than the surface method. There were like 62 items not filled, uh, showing a consistent risk understanding across methods, different than what we saw for the surface operations. And for the new method, the in-place mining as a novel uh, operation, and in this case, the perception, uh, not like an actual uh, uh, implemented method. Out of the 22, we have like a higher impact related with water pollution, water consumption, and operational cost. There was no difference between different uh, mine methods. Uh, and again, the soil and now the air pollution is for the lower for the in place. Uh, the general average was between 43 and 44. Uh, significantly lower than the surface and similar level as the underground method. There were like 73 items not filled, showing that there is a consistent not understanding of this method, and uh, but still lower than the surface, and that makes sense because this is just a concept, not be used. In conclusion, although we had like a low adherence to the surface, around 27-28%, showing there is still like a silo between different uh, uh, departments in the mining industry. The initial analysis showed the open pit as the mining method as the one with the higher impact based on expert opinion, following by underground mining method and the new mine method. This is a good response as we haven't been able to see a full scale new mine method in place. The perception in that the risk is much lower uh, half that what we could expect the surface mine method. So we expect to be able to put uh, some new mine methods on uh, on place to adjust this risk perception. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks everybody. Thanks for those uh, presentations. That was great. Really good snapshot of all those. Now we only have a few minutes left um, and I still can't see. I encourage people to put questions in the q and I don't know whether I'm not seeing that, but I, there, there is one question that actually uh, one of the presenters wanted to ask one of the other presenters. Uh, so this is for you, Peter, from David Williams. So uh, I, are you able to define uh, for Australian reach to where a pit lake is likely to remain a groundwater sink? Maybe I thought you could share that answer with the rest of the audience. Uh, sorry, yeah, thanks, Glenn. Um, so generally, it's if the if the output to the pit lake, the evaporation um, is greater than the input. So ev evaporation greater than precipitation, unless there's other surface water flows. If what's leaving is greater than what's coming in, then the water table in the pit lake should be lower than the regional groundwater. I would just caution that that's sort of a constant climate um, model and water levels in pit lakes would be expected to go up and down over time due to rainfall. And so it's a little bit misleading to assume that nothing can ever leave. But certainly on balance, we'd expect them to be to be a sink and for water to be flowing into them from all directions, which, which is good in terms of contamination and, and off-site movement. If I could just add to that too, uh, if you don't mind, Glenn, Peter. Um, no, so it's probably fair to say that the majority of Australia uh, would be expected to generate sinks rather than sources in their pit lakes, apart from you would say southwest Tasmania, where it uh, drizzles all year with that two metres per year, and parts of the wet tropics. But again, even the wet tropics could be seasonal. So you might flood during the wet season and uh, go back to being a sink um, during yeah. the, the dry season. The, the, the only other 
uh, issue, David, as you would know, is that some some pits are deliberately engineered so that there is through flow from surface water, and that is yes. quite a different category. Yes. Yeah. And the other thing I'd add is that you can, in some cases, turn a slightly net positive water balance into a negative one after mining because you've got more voids that hold water. So the proportion of the surface, which is now open to evaporation, can be much greater after mining. And a good example of that is that not in Australia, but uh, one that comes to mind is uh, the All Sands region in Alberta, where, uh, you know, slightly net positive water balance, but post mining, it's not, it goes the other way. So those water bodies will become increasingly saline over time. Anyway, back to you, Glenn. All right, thanks, David. Look, we've, we've just gone uh, a little bit over time now. Unless anybody has a burning question uh, that they'd like to ask any of these presenters, I might wrap it up and thank them again. I'm sure all the presenters would be very happy to uh, to uh, address any questions that you directly had uh, of them. But uh, thanks very much for that. And many of these uh, foundation reports will be out. So thanks, everybody, and we'll see you back shortly. <laughs>